Good evening, brain owners, multitaskers and map readers, empathizers and systemizers, possibly even Martians and Venusians. There are a few absolute certainties in science, but I feel I'm on safe enough grounds to state that everyone here has a brain. What I'm going to try to convince you in the next 15 minutes is that your brain is special. It is unique and different from your neighbours. Not because you're female and he's male or the other way around, but because even if your neighbour happens to be your identical twin, I don't know if there are any identical twins here this evening, you will have lived a different life from your neighbour, have had different experiences and encountered different attitudes. And this will be reflected in the brain you're currently hosting in your head and will continue to be reflected in that brain until the end of your life. This is a pictorial representation of what we're talking about, the, the chain of argument that informs the title of today's debate, that there are two types of bodies, male and female, uh, determined by genetic factors, and thus two types of brains. So this aspect of the argument is the basis of the essential claim in tonight's matter of debate. We need to pause and think, what do we mean by essential? One definition of an essential belief is that all members of a category share fundamental or essential qualities or essences that make them what they are. Essentialist thinking involves beliefs that the basis of such is natural, unchangeable, and grounded in deep-seated biological factors. So the reason I'm drawing your attention to this particular link here is that this is a belief that there is a firm chain between um, the bodies that we have and the brains that we have. And I think this really is what the debate is about tonight, that two, body, two different types of bodies, two different types of brains. This then results, it is claimed, in two different portfolios of skills, aptitudes, personalities. I don't know if you can see those, but it's a kind of representation of claims that um, uh, men don't listen and when women can't read maps, men are empathic, men are systemizers, etc. Um, having been the rounds of various studios today, I'm constantly being told, so what is this about men not being able to uh, show their emotions and women being multitaskers and men being map readers? So we all have clear views of what this means, what this chain of argument is. And there are also issues about the kind of roles that people play. And in order to illustrate this, I've taken um, quotes from Simon's book, the way in which the... <laughs> So we have this link here, a firm claim, which um, he does qualify later, and I'll come back to that. The female brain is predominantly hardwired for empathy, and the male brain is predominantly hardwired for understanding and building systems. And a consequence of that is a range of different skills. And we probably won't have much chance until we have questions and answers to get into that aspect, because we're really interested in that part there. Primarily, this is a debate about differences where they come from, what they mean, and crucially, how fixed and unchangeable they are. Perhaps we could even call them strong and stable. <laughs> so there's three points that I want you to think about in making up your mind on this issue. First of all, the science. This is a science debate, and we need to start by looking at the story that science is telling us. Are men's and women's brains different? Now, I should begin by clarifying to all that I'm not a sex difference denier, as I have been described, a bit like a climate change denier, presumably with the same consequences for civilization. <laughs> I am aware that there are profound anatomical differences between males and females, uh, helpfully pointed out by various trolls who like to send me JPEGs of... <laughs> I'm gonna then... I would also acknowledge that there are gender gaps in the world, in achievement, in all spheres, especially science, that I'll touch on, but also in mental health problems such as depression, self-harm, eating disorders, and in the field that both Simon and I work in, in autism. So there are differences that we need to explain. But will we find the explanation by looking at brains? 
Now, as a neuroimager, I'm, of course, aware of innumerable studies that, having divided their cohort of images into two groups, male and female, hitting sex as the independent variable in their analysis package, you can find some differences in some brains between some men and some women. In fact, the next half hour could be taken up with Simon and I, what I call um, human brain studies poker, where we swap examples of studies that have found differences, counter them with studies that haven't. Having had a sneak preview courtesy of the Today programme this morning, I could guess that Simon might offer a recent study on a human biobank data which reported clear differences in grey matter volume and brain structures such as uh, the hippocampus and the amygdala, I could then see his biobank study, perhaps en route pointing out that the average age of the participants was over 60, and you might like to wonder what different life experiences had done to those brains. But I could anyway raise him to other studies reporting no such differences. I could also note the scientific publishing currently focuses on publishing studies where differences are found. We don't get to hear so much about those where no differences between the sexes are found. So rather than drag you through uh, lots and lots of different papers, what kind of conclusion do I feel that we can draw from these studies? Simon may well disagree. The key thing is that there's no one aspect of the brain in, in key structures or grey-white matter ratios in patterns of connectivity, whatever you like to look at, that has yet been found that will reliably differentiate the brain of a woman from the brain of a man, apart from one. On average, men's brains are bigger but men are, on average, and that is a phrase we'll come back to, bigger than women. Their hearts, lungs, livers and kidneys are bigger than women's. And I don't think the Royal Institution is likely to be having a debate on that difference anytime soon. Once you correct for those size differences, almost all the alleged sex differences that had earlier been found actually tend to disappear. The same is also true of baby brains, which of course is something where we should really be looking if we believe these are innate differences and they're something that starts right at the beginning. You can, in the same way, and I did review lots of studies for the book that I've just written, find one lab which will report quite strong sexual dimorphism in a baby brain between boys' brains and girls' brains. They're usually very small cohorts cohort, so we have to be careful with the conclusions we draw. But even the same labs, three years later, will run a different uh, set of babies through the same kind of studies and find no differences. I went to a conference recently where there was a poster which, unsurprisingly, attracted my attention. It's called Time to Dump the Dimorphism. Males and female brains are far more similar than different across multiple measures of structure and function. Is there a typical, at least a typical male brain or, or female brain, some kind of template that we might compare things to? Well, recent work by um, Daphna Joel uh, and her team in Tel Aviv has looked for this very issue, looked at over 100 different structures. It's quite difficult. Hopefully, you'll get an impression of, of, of what we're looking at here. 100 different structures, some more typical in brains from men and some more typical in brains from women looking at over a 1,000 different brains, and found that brains are, in fact, a mosaic of different features. Less than 6% of those 1,000 brains had predominantly male or predominantly female features, and none had all male or all female. So I think that this is a really good pictorial representation, that every brain is different from every other brain, regardless of whether they're from men or women. There is another caveat, which I'm sure Simon will agree with, that... Even we neuroscientists have to confess that we don't really know what any of these differences mean. We might find bigger amygdala, smaller hippocampus, bigger bridge of fibres between the two different brains. But it is quite a big jump to say what this means in terms of behaviour. So even if we do find these structures, we don't really know if that explains the kind of behaviours that we're interested in, that we're looking at, that is, in fact, the basis of this whole debate. Men and women are different, so they must have different brains. If we don't know that link, it's important to bear that in mind. So, the human brain, pink, blue, 50 shades of grey matter. We really cannot currently claim that men's and women's brains are consistently and distinctly different. There is another aspect of brains that I will touch on, uh, but I will acknowledge uh, Simon's expertise in this area, so I'll only mention it briefly, and that is hormones. 
A key difference in male and female fetuses is that before birth, male babies are marinated in higher levels of testosterone than female babies, with resultant differences in their reproductive hardware. But does this also re result in differences in their brains? Very powerful lobby would claim yes. But where are we looking? If we haven't found any key differences in the brains of men and the brains of women, where should we be looking for the differences that this testosterone causes? So it's difficult to establish a brain biology behaviour link. A lot of the research in this area is carried out on animals, which is probably not an appropriate group to be looking at. But often what researchers do when they're working with humans is they go straight from hormones to behaviour, bypassing brains altogether, but inferring differences if they find behaviour differences. But all too often the behaviour they're looking at, or rather how they describe it, reveals something about the particular take they have on this, um, this research. So we have measures of gender-appropriate behaviour to match to varying levels of prenatal testosterone. We have a tomboy index to investigate the behavioural consequences in girls of being exposed prenatally to too much testosterone. So there does seem to be a strong element of begging the question here, which we should probably bear in mind. Now, remember, we're looking at differences which are supposedly fixed and unchangeable. And I did have lots of wonderful slides of taxi drivers' brains changing as they learned the knowledge and people learned to juggle. And I came across this, this wonderful picture by a six-year-old, which actually sums it up really nicely. A breakthrough in the 21st century is that our brains, A, are attached to the world, which has profound differences on those brains, and that our brains are very flexible. They actually um, change throughout our lives in a way that we never realised. We used to think we had you know, brain, baby brains developed and they became fixed, and we trundled on through life with very much the, the kind of brain that we were born with and that biology had determined. But we now know that the world through which our brains are travelling has a consistent and lifelong impact on our brains. Our brains can change as a function of the education we receive, the experiences, the occupations, the hobbies we have, the sports we play. For example, a study of spatial skills in males and females, a supposedly really robust brain-based sex difference, showed that those sex differences were actually due to video game experience. Women with the same level of such experience were as good at as men at tests of those of spatial understanding and manipulation. So we need to think very carefully. Uh, we need to think that if we're looking at a brain that has been functioning in a world, coming back to the Biobank study, 60-year-old brains, we need to remember that our brains are plastic. Our brains are also wired to be social. We are a hugely socially influenced species. Indeed, it's claimed that that's the secret of our success. So when studying brain structures or function, it's virtually impossible to tease apart what's come from the world and what's come from biology. And this does start very early. Babies' brains are tuned from birth, possibly even before, to pick up social skills. So nature is not separate from nurture or an alternative to it. It's inseparably entangled with it, which must undermine the conclusions we come to about tonight's um, motion. So that's the science. I would briefly like to say that this is a debate not just about science, but about the communication of that science, which is appropriate given that we're talking in the Royal Institution, the Science Communication Centre above all. We need to consider not just what scientists are saying, particularly in this kind of debate, but how they say it and what their audiences, readers or other science communicators are hearing. Let's take the phrase, men's and women's brains are, on average, significantly different. Well, if we look at the kind of distribution we're talking about, just let's say here we've got the data from two particular measures. In this particular one, it's the height of men and the height of women. If you plot out the data you get, you get this kind of two overlapping camel humps. You can see that there is a difference, on average, between those populations, but there's also quite a lot of overlap. So knowing that somebody's a man or somebody's a woman might not be very informative. But that's quite a marked difference in height. The kind of differences, that sex differences uh, we're talking about, are actually very small. They're of that area. So yes, there are little differences here. But if you look at the differences within the groups and the overlap between them, they're quite dramatic. And of course, if we're focusing on the male-female difference, we focus on that little difference. We don't focus on the big difference in the two groups. 
if those two groups are supposedly biologically homogeneous, then why have we got that, that difference? And I popped in the corner the kind of difference that's from that UK Biobank study again, sorry, Simon, um, to show that the claimed difference in the hippocampus between males and females has that similar kind of, of overlap. In popular parlance, the term different implies distinct, distinguishable, reliably um, distinct. All the characters we now know are not true of men's and women's brains. Significant implies meaningful, and it would be hard to know that where a man or a woman might score on any of those kind of sex difference studies. It's also the case that essential implies absolutely necessary and extremely important, which is perhaps why this debate becomes um, so vitriolic at, at points. To tie this up, I'd just like to throw into the mix the use of the term male and female. You probably believe that when we talk about male and female brains, we mean the brains from men or the brains from women. Simon himself has rather muddied the water on that one. Having made his firm statement about male and female brains in the opening lines of his book, he later qualifies it with what I find a rather startling caveat. That, and I quote, your sex does not dictate your brain type. Not all men have the male brain, not all women have the female brain. I think I'll leave you to puzzle that out and Simon to clarify it later. <laughs> to finish then briefly, this really matters. This is not just a scientific debate. This is a stereotype about males and females which informs how males and females feel about themselves. It works as a filter in research, the very field that Simon and I work in, in autism spectrum disorders, long been described as a male disorder. And more recently, we're starting to realize that that means that there are large numbers of females on the spectrum who've been missed, who are not diagnosed, do not inform research. So thinking of brains or other categories as male or female, however defined, is limiting and misleading. I'll very briefly show you some consequences of beliefs that women and men, uh, women and men have different brains. Of course, you'd think this is something that way back in the 19th century, neurologists um, looking for differences, believing that men and women are inferior. All of these were quotations about why women shouldn't be doing science because they don't have the right kind of brain. So we have the Google memo, we have Larry Summers, the then uh, head of, of Harvard, we have the Google memo author, we have Alexandra Strumio, the physics um, professor in, in uh, CERN, all of them claiming that women's brains were different, not suited for science, so science shouldn't be wasting its time on, on educating women. So I think it's not just an academic debate we're having here. It's a debate which is really important. It's a debate which informs what people feel about themselves and what other people believe. So brain owners, the choice is yours. You could support me in my bid to show that men's and women's brains are not essentially different. Are we really looking at this um, inevitable uh, evolution of a brain born small and tiny, perhaps slightly different? One goes down a nicely gendered blue channel, becomes armoured, um, resilient, can become a leader of man, um, whereas the other's a bit pink and marshmallowy, lands up <laughs> a bit princessy and a bit emotional. <laughs> so that is what we say if we think men's and brains are essentially different. Or do we believe that everybody's brain is attached to the world? Every brain is different from every other, every other brain, and that's what is important. So hopefully you'll vote for me and go with our six-year-old picture. Thank you very much.